thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I will have you know that with this wine and cheese tasting, you all combined have created one of our largest virtual tastings to date. So this is really exciting that you all are a part of this. And this almost marks a full year of us doing virtual tastings too. So this is a very, very big celebratory tasting for us. And I'm so thankful that you all are here a part of it. Uh, Quick intro for myself in case you do not know who I am, but I am Julie Harris. I am one of the uh, senior ambassadors here at Willamette Valley Vineyards. I also hold a little bit of a dual role here. Um, so I make sure our, all of our shareholders and club members are well taken care of and uh, receive all of the latest wines um, and some really nice library wines too from time to time. Um, but part of my role, I also manage um, a few different territories for our, our national sales team. So I get to hang out with our distributors in Missouri, New Mexico, Iowa, uh, Arkansas, and then also from time to time, Texas as well, um, as Texas is actually my home state. So it's always, I don't know if we have any Texans on the call here, but if you do, let me know speak up or forever hold your peace. Or if any of you ones are just ashamed that they're from Dallas, that's okay too. <laughs> All right, so um, since travel's not been happening, it's been really nice that we're able to utilize these virtual tastings just to connect with everyone. You know, if you take a look at, you know, everyone here, we have people from all across the country. So it's just really great to see that we can still all come together despite being, you know, still confined to our homes um, and that we can still share and drink great wine and eat great food together, even if we're not, you know, in the same space. Uh, and the fact that, you know, we're here and we get to share wine, wine has been throughout the centuries, just the ultimate connector for our communities. And so this is us kind of living on this tradition of sharing wine with each other, creating memories um, and just building for that. So when you have one of these wines that we're trying today and, you know, then you have it two years from now, you'll always remember this time that you, you know, we're on this tasting, you got to chat with Brian from Beechers um, and chat with me a little bit too and just share some great laughs and some great times with each other. Uh, before we really get started though, just wanna run through a few housekeeping tips. I'm sure most of you all are seasoned Zoomers at this point, um, but first off, I always like, if you take a look at your display name and a little bit how I have mine set up, um, you can go to the three dots, make sure your name is on there. And then you can also, if you want, uh, put which state or which city you're, you're sipping and nibbling um, from. I always like to just kind of see that representation from the different states on the calls. It's always nice. Um, last, or not last, but up next, um, just remember to stay muted throughout the call. Um, it just helps the flow go really easily, and we will have some time at the end where you can ask uh, Brian and myself some questions. Uh, so that'll be really fun. I have some questions for Brian, too, that I'm dying to know about, so uh, really excited to hear what he says. Um, and then Feel free to take notes along the way um, and any of your favorites that you have. I did send you all um, that really easy to use uh, virtual tasting order form. So you'll be able to get some of these bottles and have them sent to your home and recreate uh, your own tastings with any friends um, and entertain, you know, outside of this event here today. Um, then let's, let's, Let's do the big introduction here. Uh, so first off, we're so lucky to be partnering with Beechers. They have been such an amazing partner. Um, from Brian, who's the head uh, cheesemonger, to even, I think we have Emily on the call too. Emily has been my best friend throughout this process, really. She's been such a big help, and she's the one uh, that we can all thank for um, having the cheeses at our tables today. So thank you so much, Emily. Um, and then without do, let's, uh, let's put, uh, put your hands together. I don't know if you can do that. We can't really hear the clapping, but uh, I'm so excited to introduce to you all Brian Gilbert. Um, he's been with Beechers for some time now and Beechers, what I think is just the superb cheeses. They are, I think, number one in craftsmanship of cheese making. And Brian um, is their head cheesemonger. Um, he is also the a food educator and he has been certified by the American Cheese Society uh, with a certified cheese professional certification 
and certified Qi sensory evaluator. Um, so Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm, I'll quit jabbering away. I, I'm sure more people are excited to hear what you have to say. So thanks for joining us, Brian. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. And I love the collaboration partnership that we have. I have many friends on right now. I do want to also thank Emily, whom I work with closely, and Julie, um, different Julie, who the three of us at Beechers work together to make these happen and, and connect with Willamette Valley uh, Vineyards to do these. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, where was where were we going with this? I'm the head cheese monger at Beechers Handmade Cheese. <laughs> When Julie and I first got on the phone and we had similar energies, I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to peel it way back. <laughs> because so often we do these just one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't matter if there's 100 people or just two. We give it, we give 100% every single time. So thank you to my colleagues and coworkers. Thank you to Julie Harris, whom I'm working with in Crystal here at the uh, Willamette Valley Vineyards. And these are amazing wines. We have some amazing cheeses for you. We're going to go through a little bit of a lot of things to talk about. We want you to have fun. So um, Julie already said all of my credentials um, through the American Cheese Society. One is like um, CCP, similar to a sommelier of wine, a survey, a sense, um, certified survey, since, since I can't even say it, it's my certification. <laughs> Evaluator. That's what initials are for. <laughs> I know, CCSE, I say it so much, um, is really to dive into the practical part of it. And that's where they combine here. And really, I want to remind all of you that you're the experts too, right? When you go to the grocery store, when you order your wine, when you order your cheese, you're kind of, you have a sense for what you like, and we're always connecting it back to memories and senses that we know. And we'll talk more about that when we get into it, but you're the experts as well. We're just trying to match it up with what we've learned, and, and this is our world every single day. So uh, with that, um, let's get into it. That's great. I and spot on, Brian. I always say that, you know, there is no wrong way to taste. There is no right, you know, things you should be tasting. There's, of course, suggestions, um, but it's it's all up to you. Everyone tastes things. Everyone has such a unique palate. So it's going to things are going to taste different than they will uh, for me to to you, Brian. So right. um, as we begin uh, the tasting, though, just let's look at a few things that we should be considering as we start the process here. Um, so these are the, the four wines we'll be tasting. Just to refresh, I'm sure you have them on your tables, but we will be doing the 2018 Pinot Blanc, the 2018 Estate Pinot Noir, the 2017 Elton Pinot Noir, and the 2016 Cabernet Franc. Love these, love these selections. And I really love um, the pairings that me and Brian created with these because this, together I think was what makes for a truly good pairing because when you have these together there's no one I think element that really stands out you know it they it's just all very you can taste them there's nothing that's overpowering is what I'm I'm trying to say that's just and that's what a perfect taste pairing should be well it's really interesting too because we always say everybody tastes differently everybody tastes personally is another way that I like to say it too and uh, what I when we first did these there was one round when the pairings tasted a certain way. And I, of course, we always taste them right before too. And they're a little bit different. So I made more notes. And when I try them in real time with you, it, it's going to change again. It'll also depend on, you know, the balance of how much cheese you have and how much of uh, the wine you have. And, and we'll go into that. So yeah. Exactly. And how much coffee you had right before. Yeah. Too. <laughs> I won't say that I had curry green Thai food earlier. And I'm like Ooh. trying to get that off my tongue. So I that can sounds delicious. Uh, well, one of the things that I like to have on hand when I'm doing tastings, I always have either water or sparkling water, um, or you can use bread or crackers too, just to create a nice little palate cleanser, just so your palates are nice and refreshed and that not too fatigued before you begin the tasting. Um, and then when you begin to actually get into the tastings, now, I think most of you all can agree that the best part about wine is actually just drinking it and enjoying it. But if you're really wanting to get into it, there are steps that you can take to really begin to concentrate and focus and continue to learn as you're tasting. Um, so for those of you that are maybe new to tasting, just want to review a few little, little reminders that I like to look for and that I like to practice when I'm doing my tastings. Um, first off, I have my glass of Pinot Blanc right here. 
So uh, what I like to do is, you know, you can take a look and observe the color, observe the hue, observe the intensity of the color of the wine. Um, you can also take some notes on, you know, how the tears or the legs of the wine are. And that can tell you sweetness level and a little bit of how much alcohol is in the wines as well. After you're taking this observing and, and taking in, that's kind of the, I think I find that's the least fun part about it. Everyone knows tasting is the best part. Um, but then, you know, don't be afraid, just stick your nose right in the glass and just take a nice whiff of the ar aromas that you'll get there. After that, um, you can begin tasting. A uh, sense of smell is probably the biggest factor in taste. So as you're tasting too, make sure you're getting a nice inhale, you're breathing in through your nose as you are tasting. Uh, you're gonna take a sip, swish it around your mouth a little bit, see how it you know, plays on your palate, see how it coats your tongue. Is it lively? Is it silky? A um, few things to consider. And I, I, I don't like going into too many details because I, don't, I do think that it can, it can psychologically affect how you're going to be tasting the wines. Um, so, and then after that, just think about it. You know, how, how does that wine make you feel? And does it evoke any emotions? Does it evoke any nostalgia for you? I think that's one of the best things about wine is just so happy. many <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Very fresh and crisp, which is really nice right now too. It just, when I first had it, it was a little too cold. I had it in the like in the in the refrigerator and then when I had it when I pulled it out as it warms up just to the perfect temperature not too cold and too warm mm -hmm. even more nuance in the um in the smell let alone the taste absolutely and you know that's another you brought up a good point Brian and into when you're serving wines especially something like a Pinot Blanc because it is so light and you do want it cold but sometimes it doesn't serve it if you're you know just pulling it straight from the fridge and tasting it that way uh, it's like the cheeses that uh, were sent our way. You know, I, I sent you all some notes to, you know, make sure the cheeses are out about an hour in advance because that really allows for the flavors to unlock and just start to, to, to show really nicely. Judy, I have a question. Oh, sure. sure. Um, when you sent, thank you for sending that email yesterday. Um, the, the wines with the cheeses, I noticed the flagship reserve was for the Pinot Blanc and the Griffin Creek, but there are two cheeses that have the the flagship. So it was kind of listed both times. I think maybe one's one was the reserve and one's flagship reserve. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the one that goes with the Pinot Blanc is it the the regular one or the reserve? It's the flagship. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, what's interesting too? And, oh, actually, you know what, Julie? I should probably go into how to taste some cheese, right? Oh, please. I, I, I hope so. <laughs> no worries, because what will happen now is we're going to get so excited and start chatting. About I know. I know. I do that all the time. <laughs> so as Julie explained with wine, there's a whole, we don't want to get too complicated or too into it. Many pictures that you see me in conferences at the American Cheese Society or anything locally, or even here on our Zoom with 10 people or 100 people, you, you'll see pictures of me doing this. I'm exaggerating a little bit for the camera, but the idea is I've hopefully gotten this cheese warm in room temperature. Don't fret if you didn't, it's okay. But as Julie said, the more nuances, more flavors, more aromas will start to begin to pop as it gets a little bit warmer, right? So I came in a couple hours before, I cut all the cheese, I opened the bottles so everything can breathe a little bit. And even now this flagship's still a little bit cold as our fridge is a little bit cold. So I'm not telling you to do this, but I'm warming it up a little bit. It's not gonna do much, but even in just that little bit, when I open up my palms, I can already smell the, the changes and some of the caramel notes. But before we get into the actual uh, nuances of the flavors, I take a piece of cheese. And again, I'm exaggerating a little bit for the camera, but I hold it up because we say, and I don't know how exactly true this is, is that aroma falls a bit with cheese. So plus it just looks cool, right? So I'm holding it up, I'm breathing in and I'm noticing things, or am I not? If you just take a big bite and you swallow, you miss some of those nuanced. And if, if you're feeling your gastronomic delight, that's okay, do that. If you wanna dive a little bit deeper, I'll take the one so I can keep this pretty that I've already <laughs> taken a chunk out of. And I'm gonna take a bite. When I take a bite, I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna make a little bit of a paste. I'm gonna cover the sides of my cheeks, the roof of my mouth, my tongue, below my tongue, wherever you can get a nice coat and then pause, swallow, 
and breathe out. When you breathe out, your olfactory sensories are going to start lighting up, as I mentioned earlier, things that you can connect them to. If I notice cotton candy, which isn't anything I would ever think of in a pairing. Sometimes I'm like, wow, that reminds me of an experience I had long ago. So, and on and on, we can go down the rabbit hole. But right now, take a bite, cover your mouth, swallow and breathe out. And what we're gonna do now, Julie and I are gonna talk about how we're gonna marry the two because same thing basically, but you're doing both. Julie, you do, wanna, do you wanna lead this one part? Yeah, absolutely. So usually when you're doing cheese and wine specific pairings. Um, I, and this could vary, but I, this is the way that I prefer because I'm more wine focused than Brian is, I'm sure. <laughs> he might do it the I don't opposite. Know if that's true. That's not necessarily true. These bottles are coming <laughs> home after and my partner Mickey and I are gonna enjoy them, so. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I hope so. Um, so I, when you're doing your tasting, I always, we do those steps that I discussed at the beginning. Um, you're going to take a sip of the wine singularly, go through that process, observe, and think about how that feels. Usually, I think it takes about up to three sips to really get a full impression of the wine. So keep that in mind, too. But then when we're doing it with the cheese, so we'll take the Pinot Blanc and the flagship that we'll be tasting first. So take a sip of the wine, go through that, and then you're going to take a sip of the cheese. Take a bite of the cheese, not a sip, sorry. And you're gonna go through the process that Brian just described. You're gonna see how both of those interact singularly. And then you're gonna take another sip of the wine and you're gonna see how those flavors interact. What opens up, what changes? Does it change the mouthfeel? Does it change the acidity? Uh, just uh, some things to take notice of when you are going through that. And then you're gonna observe. But of course, most of all, you're going to just enjoy it. And, and at the end of the day, it's if you like it or if you don't really. All right, I've taken a little of my bite and it's a little bit different than when I tried it 20 minutes ago. And I have a little bit of a, like I, I, I used the adjectives before because toffee popped out, cotton candy and a buttery. Now, some of this cheese, because it is a little bit on the stronger side, it uh, has a little bit of the tyrosine crystals, little crunchy bites that you find in the cheese. The piece that I'm eating is on the end. It's actually probably calcium lactate, which is very similar to tyrosine crystals. But um, this piece that I have, you may not have a similar piece. When I cut it, it was on the end. And uh, those little crunchy bites changed my experience from when I had a bite that didn't have those. So that's another layer. But it gave a little bit of a caramel note. I, well, I don't know. Do you say caramel or caramel? I, I never know. I say both. I flip back and forth. <laughs> Caribbean. I don't know. Anyways, so you take that. And so I had a little bit of a texture note too. And then the it, it, it deadened some of the wine at first. Then I tasted uh, the sharpness, as we say often, the citrusy of the, of the cheese. And then I noticed more of a honey wine wash at the back. And it was really refreshing. So for me, my experience was I had a little bit of a pairing together, which was somewhat neutral. Then I tasted cheese, then I tasted wine, then I tasted cheese, then I tasted wine. So for me in this particular one, it was a little bit of a, like a, an on and an off again thing. What's you got? Anything? Exactly. <laughs> um, and I thought it, it might be helpful um, while everyone else is tasting because I feel, you know, sometimes people don't have the vocabulary for what they're tasting. And again, that comes with practice. Um, and again, most, most of what you're tasting is going to be um, a lot of aromatics too. So let me just share the screen here really quick. You'll see that. Okay. So as we get into the tasting and the wines, and you're taking a note of the aromatics and you're tasting it, there's going to be really three... Um, three groupings of aromatics to pay attention for, pay attention to. The first one is gonna be the primary aromas. These are gonna be the more grape focused aromatics. You're gonna get um, a lot of your berries, your fruits, your white flowers, your citrus from this element. Um, the second one is gonna be the secondary aromatics. And that is gonna come a lot from uh, the, the whole, um, kind of winemaking and fermentation process. So you'll get some notes of maybe breadiness, brioche, butter from time to time. Um, and then, uh, you, of course, you have the tertiary aromatics. Um, 
And those are going to be derived from how the wine is aged. So is it aged, you'll be able to tell if it's aged in French oak, you can taste a lot of the hazelnut and vanilla uh, baking spice uh, flavors from that. And then as you're tasting, of course, you can kind of observe the five different tastes. So of course, is it sweet? Is it, wine's not gonna be salty most of the time, but every once in a while, you'll get a little bit of wine that's more minerally and more salty. So pay attention to that too. Um, you also have bitter. Um, a lot of the uh, wines can have an astringency to it and can often produce some bitter um, herbal herbaceous type uh, characteristics. Um, and then of course, umami, you have, I have, Stuff like mushrooms and grilled meats that you can sometimes get from wine from time to time. Black olives too is another interesting one. Um, and then citrus, of course. Most wines are going to have a great amount of acidity and especially with wines from the Willamette Valley, we naturally have higher acidic wines. Um, so it, honestly, it just makes for great food pairing wines because acidity is the, the ultimate. It goes with fattiness, it goes with saltiness, it goes with sweet. Um, it's, it's a big player there in the tasting game, I think. <laughs> okay, Brian, let's get into the tastings. But I'm, I, as we're tasting, I think it's important that we kind of hear historically like about a little bit about Beecher's and a little bit about how uh, the cheese is made. Yeah, I can... Uh, I you know, if you come visit me, it's in Seattle or in the before times New York, we, we make our cheese in both facilities. So well, I wanted to show you a few pictures that we have here. It's not the full scope, but kind of, kind of give you a sense for what happens and where it happens. We're not going to spend more than a couple minutes so we can really continue to taste some wines and eat some cheese. But what you're looking at on the left side is Beecher's Handmade Cheese. That's where I'm at on the weekends right now, by the way. You can say hello if you're visiting and it's safe to visit. And I'm the one wearing the mask, so it'll be easy to find. Actually, I'm the one that almost always wears a Beecher's hat, so you can find me. Plus, okay, Brian, I'm visiting you this weekend, so uh, watch out. <laughs> mannerisms, and I'm smiling, and I think you can see it in my eyes, but that's a good story. Anyways, the picture on the left is Beecher's Handmade Cheese, where we started in 2003. Kurt Beecher Dammeyer, the owner, CEO, entrepreneur, wanted to show how, like, he wanted to show full trans transparency to how food is made through the medium of cheese. Jumping forward, I got to, to I get to tell that story and teach food education through the medium of cheese every day, even if I'm serving mac and cheese, which usually I say when I'm doing a small Zoom meeting, raise your hands if you've had Beecher's mac and cheese, or which is used, we use flagship to make that, or been to the New York store and seeing us making cheese at 22nd and Broadway as well. So we make cheese in both of those facilities, full transparency, looking through the windows and watching the cheese being made by the cheesemakers. And that's where the majority of all of our cheese is made. And in the next slide, you'll see a little bit of, um, let's see what we got next. We have cows. <laughs> cows. <laughs> cows, we need cows to make, to produce milk. Um, all of our farms, we have two and two, two in Washington here, um, um, Green Acres Farms and Groenveld, and then also Ohms Farms and Dutch Hollow Creamery in New York. So basically, the cow on the left, she has black and white spots. That's Holstein. Generally speaking, the yield is a little bit higher. And um, um, the, the, the protein level, the butter fat is a little bit lower, right? The cow on the left is Jersey cow. Typically, we have a little bit higher in protein, a little bit yellower, yellower in color, and is a little bit higher in butter fat. So what we do at Beecher's is we blend both of those milks to create flagship and all of the cheeses that are variations of flagship. And in the next slide, you'll see a little dive into um, the Beecher's cheese making facility. That's a picture I took. Uh, the picture right before it was a picture I took of um, milk being pumped in in the morning. A big tanker comes to Pike Place in Pine Street. There's about a six degree grade, maybe a little less, that gravity helps that fire hose. I say fire hose, that hose that attaches to the side of the building. And next slide, we'll see, we get basically 40,000 pounds of milk delivered every day. We measure in pounds, but butter fat's different. We want it to be consistent with our cheese making, but milk isn't produced the same way every single time as the seasons change. So our job as cheese makers is to balance a nice balance of science and art, right? We're keeping track of numbers, we're checking everything, we're keeping clean and safe and all the things you have to do from a business point of view, but the cheesemaker really has to know um, to put their fingers into the coagulant, the, the custard-like consistency that you'll see in the next slide in a second, um, and understand where it is and where it needs to be to get it 
get the high quality cheese that you're eating. So if you look at the tank on the left, it's a make vat where we make the cheese. It's a vat that holds about 10,000 pounds of milk. The vat on the right is a cheddaring table or a draining table. It's on a slight angle so liquid can drain out. And the vat that you see with the like warning sign on it is a holding tank. That holding tank holds about um, well, 30,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds in the make vat. So collectively, we get 40,000 pounds of cheese, I'm sorry, of milk every day. Cow's milk is about a 10 to one ratio. So essentially we have about 4,000 pounds of cheese every single day that we make at Pike and about 6,000 pounds of cheese that we make at our New York store. So collectively about 10,000 pounds of cheese every single day. Now I would, a lot of people would say that seems like a lot and it is, because there's cheese makers that make much smaller volumes. And then there's cheese makers that make much larger volumes up to like 500,000 pounds a day and even more. Granted, I would never villainize the bigger companies. That's not a thing for me. It's just that we're a little bit different. We get to see and process and touch and have a lot of control over every batch that we do. So let's roll through the next couple of pictures and we'll get into some wine. All right. Next one is we're adding cultures or rennet. Cultures give the cheese a direction. Rennet solidifies the batch and turns it into a solid, as you can see on the right coagulant. And then in the next slide, we are cutting the curd. You've heard the, the term, maybe, maybe not. Um, all of the Little Miss Muppet sat in her tuppet eating her curds away. Next slide. I know I had to throw that in there some way. <laughs> I thought you were going to make a cut the cheese joke at first. <laughs> no, I that. When I hear it, I go, I just smile and nod. Um, <laughs> the curd on the left looks a lot like ricotta cheese or ricotta. Uh, ricotta, depends where you live. Um, basically, that's the first part of the curd. The, the picture you see on the right is a harp. It looks like a musical harp or a cheese wire. It's a frame that has wire strung vertically and horizontally. Now, thing to note about this, because I, you know, going through this part a little bit fast, is even the distance between the wires matters because you'll get a certain size curd, which will expel whey at a certain rate. All these things matter in making cheese, just like you'll see in the wine. Next slide, you'll see um, us stirring the curd. We got to keep everything moving because lactic fermentation is happening really, really fast. Let's made up number, Mach 5. It's going really fast. At some point, we're going to have to slow it down and drain the liquid, which you see on the left. And then it does, does go under the floor, it goes into the sanitation sewage instead of the storm drain. So the city loves that we're doing it. We're cutting the curd, which allows um, us to cheddar the cheese. This is all cheddars are cheddar, but not all cheddar cheeses are cheddar. You can ask me about that in the notes later. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I'd like to say about that here though is the process of cheddaring is very specific to cheddar and allows the texture and the flavor and everything that we know about cheddar style cheeses to taste that way. Other cheeses can be manipulated different ways to be, have different textures and different pHs and different uh, end consistencies. So when we go to the next slide, we'll see us flipping the loaves, taking temperature, checking the pH. At some point, we're gonna drop these loaves or slabs of cheese into um, it looks like a wood chipper. It's a curd mill. It chops it up into the curds that when you go to Pike Place Market and you taste a fresh curd or a squeaky cheese in Wisconsin, I'm from Michigan, so I know squeaky cheese or Idaho, wherever you live, squeaky cheese, different cheeses will have different consistencies that will ride on the enamel of your teeth. So if you get a really tightly packed cheese and you, and you bite into it, it talks back to you in your head a little bit. Ours don't do it as much. It's just simply a different recipe. It's flagship. And we go to the last uh, I think it's the last one coming up here. Last slide, we'll have cheese plate. So I can go more into cheese making all day. As you can see with my energy, I can nerd out to it. So if we, we love have, it. <laughs> have questions at the end, we'll talk about it, but we're going to dive into, I believe we're going to dive more into the wine and some of the cheese making a great platter and everything. So Julie, I'm going to bounce it back to you. That was awesome, Brian. I I have always, you know, been so curious about how to make cheese. And it's always great, I think, to know and have an understanding of where the food you are enjoying is coming from. So that totally, you know, it, it creates this connection when you're enjoying it. Um, now, a few people had asked um, before the call, you know, how do you build a great cheese board? You know, if we're eating cheese, what, what components do you like in a cheese board? And what I say to that, variety. Variety is the spice of life. So you want a little bit of everything on there. You want crunchy, you want creamy, you want 
ooey and gooey. And then you want, I always like to have a mix of both fresh fruit and then dried fruit as well. Throw in some nuts in there, a couple of variations of charcuterie and at least uh, three different types of cheeses. Um, but it's, it's totally up to you and what you enjoy at the end of the day. Um, Brian, what do you, what's your take though? What do you usually yeah. like to incorporate? If we're doing cheese and wine, I mean, there, there are different ways you can go about it. Everything that you said and more. I like to start with more mild cheeses first. I like to have three or four, but not too many more. Personally, I like more, but you want to put your stronger ones towards the end. Washed rind cheeses, you know, the stinky ones or blue, you might want to keep near the end. Basically, what I'm talking to customers at the counter, I, I mean, initially, I'm going to say balance, you know, have a, a nice even balance of your strength. So if you have a strong cheese, you might want a stronger wine. If you have a lighter cheese, you might want a lighter wine. As far as um, as far as like dried fruit, fresh fruits, I like pickled things on there too. Yeah. I have very much a sweet tooth, but sometimes pickled things you would never pick up. My, my main point is experiment, experiment, experiment. Like we uh, at the American Cheese Society a couple of years ago, and ever since then I've been doing this and uh, my partner's um, uh, half Asian as well, Japanese. So we do a lot of Japanese things where we do like pickled Japanese uh, pickled things that I don't know the names of, but we use matcha sometimes rolled in shed. There's lots of fun things you can do. I'm always pairing like even, even curry. I mentioned green curry earlier. Like I'm pairing things all the time. Now with wines, you don't want to get too strong and you don't want to get too crazy, but experiment, have fun with it, but definitely fresh fruits, usually about three or four cheeses, three or four wines, light to more strong. Um, Cured meats, of course, are great. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves prosciutto or um, um, just different salamis or uh, salumis, but yeah. Oh, I love salumis. <laughs> and that's what you had mentioned about having a pickle on your plate. Like I 100% because the pickle is gonna have that nice punchy acidity. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you have something with that acidity and it's kind of going up against a wine, it can sometimes cancel out the acidity of the wine and make it just so much smoother. Um, so that's always interesting to experiment with, I find. And, and a lot of times, like we always say, I, Julie does this, I do this all the time. Like there's so many different pairings and a lot of them are really great. And some of them clash. Well, all, what I do most of the time is try to find the ones that clash and just avoid those. But even sometimes you'll, you'll take a, you'll have a pairing and you'll taste something, whether it's a meat or any of the things we just mentioned, and you'll have a bite and you'll taste the cheese and you'll taste the wine. And then sometimes you'll taste them both and they create an entirely new flavor. That's what we love. That's not always what happens, right? Sometimes a cheese will uh, make a wine better. Sometimes a wine will make a cheese better. So it's just really interesting how it can play off each other. And I think I saw someone ask a question, how do you get your cheeses so uniform? Um, personally, for me, I just use a mandolin, like a little thin mandolin, um, and that slices my cheese. Brian, you might have like a, a better tool, though, than what I use, I'm sure. <laughs> it was off screen. I had to go get it. Okay. <laughs> so when I'm here, this is a big one. It's called a handy wire or a wire cutter. Basically, I put a piece of cheese on... This is, this, you don't have to do this. They, they make much smaller versions of like Sur La Table where I'm at yeah. or any, a lot of cheese shops are online and you're cutting through the cheese. It has a nice clean cut if the, or a nice thin cheese knife. I actually have some back here that I'll dig out in a second, but um, a thin knife or a wire is best. That's actually what, I, not a mandolin, but that's more along the lines of what I used. It has, it almost looks like, I don't know why I said mandolin, but it you has like- it You just did this. Yeah, right? Julian? <laughs> down, 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 down. <laughs> Julian? Yes. This, this is what we use. It's from it's from Cutco. Um, it comes in a set of other things too. But I've played around with the wire cheese cutters and all that stuff. This is the best thing ever. That is good. I'm always looking for like the next best cheese knife. I have a couple that I use and I, I'm always like, is this the right one? I'm not sure. Um, so that's a good bite. I might have to look out for that. <laughs> if you buy Cutco from a college student, you will help the college student. <laughs> help them make the looks. <laughs> I used to have Cutco's in high school, so it's still going. Straight. I have one of those little knives here. Different shapes of knives will do different things. This is my everyday knife that I love using for everything. It has a nice shape to it. There are thinner knives for like blue cheese. They're very thin too. 
planer. If you, I don't, I don't use a planer these days too often. Um, some of these knives will be like chisels for chiseling some mm -hmm. of the harder parm style cheeses. There's so many different kinds. Just have fun with it. Whatever works is great. That's good to know about the chisel one. I got that as part of a little cheese knife set. And I'm never, I'm like, do I use it with like a creamier cheese and just smear it on something? But to, to know that it's actually a chiseler, that's like really good knowledge right there. <laughs> this would be like a parm chisel in a sense. It has an okay. eye formation and it, it starts it, it, it has a starting. And then when you go in, it really kind of breaks it apart nicely. But oh, you can do it on a wood counter so you don't break into your tile or dull the edge. And be careful with them. Yeah, good call. <laughs> All right, let's see what we have here. Guys, let's get to the numbers we've all been waiting for. I'm sure you guys are salivating and drooling at this point. <laughs> I'm I mean, not, we can nine can talk wine and cheese all day. So if you want to hear us ramble on for another hour, we can. I know, I've been sitting all <laughs> along, so I'm not, I'm not salivating here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So um, everyone, you know, and I'm sure you, you know, don't feel intimidated to open up all of the bottles. If you're, you just choose one, that's fine. But for anyone that does have the Pinot Blanc open, uh, we're going to be starting with that one. Um, this one, we did select the uh, Beecher's flagship to pair with it. Um, a little bit of background on the Pinot Blanc as you start to sip it and observe and go through those steps. Um, so Pinot Blanc, as you taste it, and if you were to not look at the label, you would find that it tastes very similar to Pinot Gris. Um, and in fact, in a lot of blind tastings, Pinot Blanc is often very, very commonly confused for Pinot Gris. Um, and one of the big reasons for that, um, it's actually genetically related to Pinot Gris. It is actually the offspring of Pinot Noir, and through a mutation of Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc uh, was was started and they started just to, to grow for those qualities and characteristics that Pinot Blanc had to offer. And as you taste it, it's just so electrifying and just it kind of awakens your palate and refreshes your palate a little bit. Um, for the process of this, so we take these grapes, um, we source it from Tualatin Estate Vineyard, which I don't know if anyone's been out to Forest Grove to the Tualatin Estate property before. Um, but it's a gorgeous place. Um, those vines out there planted in 1972 by this man right here. That's Bill Fuller. Um, he was a winemaker in California for many years and wanted to break off and start his own thing. And he had been looking towards, uh, towards Oregon and towards Washington a little bit and had done a little bit of searching. Finally, he came across uh, this plot of land um, in Forest Grove, Oregon. It's right underneath the coastal range, so it has a little bit of a rain shadow on this area. So the concentration of flavors from the fruit coming out of this is just immense. Um, and so we are very lucky that this is one of our estate properties and our estate vineyards that we can source our, our fruit from. Um, so with this wine, it is aged in stainless steel, uh, cold fermented, and doing that really allows those really lovely aromatics just to be very present in there. Um, and we're gonna be, as I said, enjoying it with the Beecher's flagship. So we're gonna take what, uh, what Brian said, we're gonna sniff it, bring it up to your noses, maybe not, don't stick it up your nose, but just like in the area. <laughs> I've definitely done that with wine when I've been trying to swirl and sniff before. It's not fun. Um, but Brian, do you want to tell us a little bit about the flagship? Yes, flagship is our signature cheese. Flagship is a cross between a cheddar and a gruyere. You know, when I, I train our staff a lot, I would always say use the word cross because it was intentional. When I use the word blend earlier with milks, because we're blending the two milks when it comes to that. But flagship is, um, if you think about the notes that it has, it has a nice um, caramel or caramel taste. It's robust. We use the word sharp and a lot of people have different understandings of what sharp actually is or how they describe it or what they're tasting. But I would say if we want to kind of keep it simple, it's medium sharp. It doesn't get too strong and it's very creamy. Now, uh, Gruyere, when we say Gruyere, it's a Swiss style cheese. A lot of times we invoke the, the cheese that's the triangle or whatever with holes in it. I'm not, I'm not trying to invoke that. Basically a creamy cheddar in a sense, right? It has really nice flavors. It's incredibly versatile, like melting it. It's great. It's great on a grilled cheese sandwich. It's great on a cheese plate. 
and it's wonderful pairing with cheeses. Um, what's interesting, when we had this lineup, um, I don't always put a white with flagship. I often put a, a Pinot or something else. But what's really nice about flagship is it's so versatile. It covers so many different areas. It can do different things. So as I mentioned, kind of in the front of this, when I started throwing adjectives out, I noticed some things about what it was doing. And I mentioned a little bit of a roller coaster of flavors. What I like about flagship is um, because it covers so many different, different areas, it really does well with this. It's refreshing at first, at least in my pairing taste, and then I taste the cheese and then it's refreshing afterward. It's, um, I can't think of the word that I want right now, but, and again, you'll probably do that too. We might drop flavors and things that we think and you might come up with something else or you might not have a word for it. But what's really nice is it does give you a little bit of a refreshing balance with like that nice, sweet, creamy, slightly sharp, familiar taste that you have in, in cheddar style cheeses. Brian, we had a great question from Tina. Uh, yeah. She's just wanting to know if uh, cheese is like wine and it opens up the longer it sits at room temperature. Yes, definitely. Like we want you to do, but we don't want to get too carried away. Like, so you, we generally recommend bringing your cheeses out about an hour before you're going to have them. Um, soft cheeses, keep in mind, like soft ripened brie style cheeses will get a little bit runny. So you kind of want to time it. But yeah, opens up would be the word we'll use for wine. Um, with cheese in general, you're gonna taste more of the flavors and the nuance that it has to offer. Like everything about it. Like as we're tasting this, as we get near the end of the hour, I'm noticing more flavors even now. So yes, it does. Thank you so much. You're getting a lot of wonderful feedback about that flagship and you have been uh, referred to as the Tom Brady of cheese. <laughs> I saw that, that's my favorite. Oh my God. So many inside jokes that I can't go into now, but later. <laughs> oh my God. That's hilarious. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> All right. So oh, as of you know, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take it, Brian. Let's uh let's let us enjoy the wine and the cheese a little bit. Let's uh let's talk what we're tasting here. Yeah. What are you what are you what are you noticing or you're eating right now? Okay. We have to alter. Oh. What did you do? <laughs> what were you saying, Brian? We have to alternate back and forth so we're not both eating at the same time, right? I know. That's why that's why I opted not to do the crackers. Um, because no one wants to hear me crunch really loudly over the screen, I feel like. <laughs> So uh, we are going to take, you know, our first impressions of the wines, you know, beautiful aromatics. I get a lot of like orange blossom, um, almost like some preserved lemon too on the nose. Very citrusy, very refreshing, almost. Um, yeah, wow, that's really floral too, at least as it gets a little bit warmer. And it's really like mm -hmm. a, a light, a different kind of floral than I'm used to as well. That's really nice. It's it, wow. That's great. Isn't that nice? And as it's it's been, I have had this in my glass for a little bit now. But as it started to open up, I even get you know I get a little bit of like the candied lemons and a little bit mm -hmm. of like lemon zest. But also it's starting to have like this really nice like honeyed quality to it. As yeah, well. it, it, I was noticing. You know, we always often say like that green apple and honey kind of mix. Exactly. So let's try it with the cheese. I only have this much left. Oh no. <laughs> I have more here, but. <laughs> All right, so ah. we're gonna follow your steps. We're gonna put it in our mouth and kind of let it melt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, what I noticed too is like when I taste, when I, I'm, I'm a little bit hungry right now too, which will play into it. So as I eat, I notice I grabbed a bigger bite of cheese, which will play yeah. differently than if I take a little less cheese. But either way, whatever you wanna do, you wanna balance it a little bit. So you get that really, that flavor of both the cheese and the wine. And you'll, you'll find your desire and liking. But um, when I had a little bit more cheese, of course, I was tasting more of the, the um, crunchy bites because the piece I have is a little bit textured. And then I had a, like a refreshing wash of, of the wine afterward. All those citrusy notes that Julie was talking about, I noticed way at the end. I noticed the cheese right up front. Um, so yeah. That's really nice. And someone mentioned um, how it's cleansing and it cuts some of the fat in the cheese. That exactly. I think is my favorite, I think, way to think of a pairing too, is like 
acidity, citrus, and fat, you know, they play so awesome together. And in this instance too, you get this really nice fatty uh, cheese that we're eating. Um, and then with this, it almost, after taking a bite of the cheese and then to the wine, it really changes the body and mouthfeel of the wine. It's so much more silkier, I feel like right. afterwards. Yeah, you, it really smooths it out. Silky is probably the best word I would have for that. As I see the legs on there and the acidity, you get a sense for it, but when you, it just carries it really well. Absolutely. What I like too is like there's there I wouldn't describe this wine as having a long finish, but in a sense with the cheese, it just carries on a little bit longer. And that I like that so much. I just like that because I get the gift that keeps on giving in a sense. And I wouldn't really say that with white wine, but even right now I took that sip and it's still lingering on my tongue. And if I had had the cheese in my mouth at the same time, the sweetness was kind of contained to the middle, or actually I would say on the edges, and then the wine was in the middle of my tongue. Now mm -hmm. everybody's gonna have a different experience. That's just what I'm noticing. I'm a fan. So does anyone, anyone joining us, who has any comments, anyone tasting anything really unique or unusual? Hey, Bruce. And Hi. Hi. Um, so I just want to comment. I, I, I really like this. It's a, it's a very nice wine. And um, truthfully, usually we do not like wine that is steel kegged or whatever you call it, steel, aged in steel. Aged in steel. Usually we can taste the steel and it, we don't like the way it tastes, but this is really good. So just wanted to let you know. That's awesome. And I think, you know, don't discount stainless steel because stainless steel is sometimes the best way to taste that pure fruit that we're growing. So we're farmers out here. So we grow exceptional fruit. So being able to, you know, create wine and age it in stainless steel is amazing because you're just getting that pure fruit expression with it. So definitely, definitely don't discount that next time you see that. You learned something today from us. <laughs> All right. It is amazing how much of a Pinot Gris it does. It is similar to that. Right. Yeah. If you were to like totally like not look at the label, be like, oh yeah, it's, it's Pinot Gris. I feel like this is sometimes a little bit more um, rounder, a little bit more creamier in mouthfeel than our Pinot Gris at least. Right, right. It's lovely. Uh, Brian, we did have another question of what the... Um... Uh, what is the best way to uh, store your cheese after you've opened it? That's great. And that, you know, you'll hear so many different variations. I'm just going to tell you middle of the road what we were taught, what we know from experience. But basically, I'm going to plug cheese paper. Cheese paper is a double lined paper that has parchment on the inside and a perforated cellophane on the outside. And you wrap it, it allows the cheese to breathe, but doesn't let it dry out. Now that's my go-to selling cheese paper. You don't need to buy cheese paper. Parchment works great. In some cases for some cheeses like blue cheeses, aluminum foil works great. The idea is you want the cheese to breathe. You don't want it to dry out. I typically put it in my lettuce crisper. If you have a lettuce crisper down below in your fridge or wherever it is, because it'll keep it from drying out. The take home note is if you see mold on that cheese, trim that mold off, continue to eat your cheese. Because all we're doing is growing mold anyways, trimming it off before we sell it to you. However, I don't know what's in your fridge. So turn it off, enjoy it. When it dries out, it doesn't taste very good, right? It's just drying like it. So just that's when you would say it, it isn't very favorable. But in general, a lot of people will still wrap it in plastic. That's not awful. Again, it'll probably mold because the outside is trying to, the, the bacteria are trying to get out and it can't. So it wraps around to the face. Again, just trim that cheese off, continue to eat it. But yeah. Those are great tips. I, I always use parchment paper. I wouldn't even know where to buy cheese paper. I feel Any like. Any will have cheese paper, but you don't, well, many of them, but again, you really don't need that. It's great as a gift because it kind of teaches what I'm explaining right now to somebody. Um, but at the same time, I mean, because often Formaticum and some of the different cheese paper brands will have that, but your soft ripened cheeses already come in cheese paper or wax paper because that's how they ship them. So really we're talking about the harder cheeses. I've had one of these cheeses, the Cryovac version of a flagship, four-year flagship. And I got it when I first started. I've been here almost nine years. It's almost 15 years aged. Now, just because it's been in my fridge that long doesn't mean it's good or bad. I'm gonna say it's not harmful, but bad is a very relative term. It's not unsafe. It's a matter of flavor. If you don't like the taste, it's done. 
Yeah, it's just not going to be optimal deliciousness. Technical, exactly. technical term, optimal yumminess. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's take a take a taste of the estate Pinot Noir. Uh, most of you, I'm well, all of you has have received the 2018 estate Pinot Noir. But what you don't know is we just released the 2019 vintage here, which I actually get to taste. I've only tasted it probably one other time. So um, the 2018 that you guys are tasting is an exceptional vintage, I think. Um, our estate Pinot Noir, it is one that I like. It's kind of like our version of the flagship. You know, it's, it's the one I think that showcases our winemaking skills and the grapes we grow the best. It does have a blend of fruit from all three of our estate vintages, and it is unmistakably an Oregon Pinot Noir from the very first quaff of it. You know, you get that nice earthiness. It's like you're, you know, walking in a forest with when you bring this up to your nose. It's it's wonderful. Um, so I kind of jumped ahead. Sorry. Um, so I am having the 2019, and oh my gosh, wow, that is absolutely incredible. This was. It just keeps surprising me. Every vintage, I thought 2018 was the best vintage, but this is, this is smelling really great. I just had to kind of gush over it a little bit. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, um, it's obviously a 2018 estate Pinot Noir. Um, it is fruit from all three of our estate properties. Um, so back when Jim Bruno, our founder, was first uh, getting set up, he found, I was going to jump over here, sorry walk and talk. Um, go back. Oh, there we go. So uh, Jim Bruno, who is native Oregonian, um, and he founded Willamette Valley Vineyards back in 1983. Uh, and he pretty much just did it. He started it on his own, just had enough money just to purchase the land. Um, but of course, he had his sights set on kind of exploring all of the all of the potential, all the growing potential that Oregon has. Uh, so he bought this vineyard and with the help of really a community, he was able to kind of grow this business and grow, you know, this beautiful wine that he was making. So he worked with the government to create these regulations to allow for small businesses to be publicly funded. So we were almost like a co-op in the early days. Um, and then over the years, of course, we added Tualatin Estate and then Elton Vineyard as well. Um, started by Dick and Betty O'Brien in the same year we started in 1983. And just all all of them are such unique vineyard sites and they just add so much to this to this wine they really complete this full painting this full masterpiece of this wine um, and it is done in french oak barrels french oak um, is an important tool um, because it allows wines to age a lot longer um, and it just adds some really nice interesting elements to it so with there we go there's our barrel cellar there um, but with the the french oaks um, that's the, the barrels that we usually prefer. It does have a tighter wood grain than American oak. So it's gonna let the rate of oxygen into the wines um, be a lot slower. So the wine can age and fully develop as the winemaker had intended. Um, and you can notice that when you're smelling it, you can get a little bit, you get a little bit of that like, cocoa, um, a little bit of chocolate on the nose too as well. And then we're gonna be pairing it with the Dutch Hollow Dulcet. Stop sharing. And Brian, I want to hear about the Dutch Hollow Dulcet because once this was actually my first time trying it and I absolutely fell in love with it. It's the most dreamiest cheese. This is great. So yeah, um, so for one, I really, I really love this wine. It is, as you said, the forest floor, it's mineral, not minerally, but um, it's just a sense of place as we say in a very cliche way, but I really think of Oregon in that way. And um, it's just a beautiful, a beautiful Pinot. But as far as cheese goes, um, Dutch Hollow Dulcet. So we make flagship and all of our, our variations of flagship at Pike Place Market and in New York. Now, New York very specifically, as I mentioned earlier, we have two farms we get our milk from. One is Ohm's Farm. Um, it's north of the city, so south of Albany in that area. And, um, and Dutch Hollow. Dutch Hollow is a little bit more of a picturesque farm. There's classes and learning. It's a little bit of a dairy co-op. We buy most of their milk. So we're, we work exclusively with them. But Dutch Hollow Dulcet is one of 
We have two cheeses, our Just Jack and our Dulcet, that are the only cheeses that we make that are a different style from cheddaring. When you saw the pictures earlier, there's a point where I called one spot of it cheddaring. The difference with a Jack or a Dulcet or Gouda's and some other styles of cheese is sometimes we'll wash the curd, the very first curd you saw with fresh water. Fresh water will wash away the bacteria that would otherwise be eating the, um, the, the milk source, the milk sugar, the lactose. And so it ends at least initially being a bit creamier, a little bit sweeter from the, the lactic milk. Now, granted, a lot of lactose is gone by the time the cheese is made, um, but you get this nice, creamy, delicious double cream in a sense. I could go into it more, but essentially we add a little bit of cream to this batch because when this is all Jersey cow milk, when you use all Jersey cow milk, it tends to be, at least in our experience for this cheese, a little bit on the bitter side. So the cream kind of cuts that a little bit. When we get into the like the pairing, when Julie and I talk about that, we'll, we'll go a little bit more about what we're noticing and what it does with the wine. But what's really interesting is this is a very firm, like a firm double cream. And the way I describe double or the creams, generally speaking, zero to 60% butterfat is are just cheese, right? Then you get 61% to 74% thereabouts. Then you're in your double cream range. And then 75% or higher, you're in your triple cream range, which is typically typically like typically, <laughs> typically. That's a new one. Typically <laughs> like your um, your brie style cheeses, right? So this is very it's not super unique, but it's unique in this way because it does a couple things. You have a firm cheese, it's very creamy, and then how it plays with everything else is just wonderful. So yeah, Dutch, Dutch hollow dull set from Beechers, New York. And it's only this probably is a really great melting cheese too. Like I notice it instantly, like just melts in my mouth. So. It is, yeah, it's so buttery. And also, so this range is in about a 61 to 62% butterfat range, just to give you a sense for it. So it's very subtle, but it's there. Nice. So let's take a taste and see. I've been, I've already been kind of sneaking tastes and yeah. so my little while you were bit. talking. <laughs> normally we're like you know julie and i do these we all do these a lot so we're like num 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 but like mm, this is good <laughs> i know i can't stop eating this one <laughs> wow this 2019 is really smelling i'm you guys i wish you were smelling the 2019 but the 2018 I, it's very similar actually it has this this really powerful aromatics um that just it's very, very romantic smelling. Like it almost just like completely transports you to another place. So what I would say is you take your sip that I noticed as far as some flavors. When I took a little bit and a little bit, I couldn't quite place what I was tasting. When I had a little bit more cheese and a little bit more wine, I was able to enjoy it differently. Plus I have more cheese and more wine. So who wouldn't enjoy that more, right? But basically, um, the cheese held on and it's nice and really creamy. And then I started noticing almost like uh, beyond the, the, the sweetness, Brussels sprouts, a little bit bitter in the center of my yeah. tongue. You know, we often say bitter is, well, a lot of times American palates are like sweet, 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 sweet. I guess that's everywhere now, but I like when I taste a little bit of that bitterness and then pepper just flooded in from the wine. It's all that forest floor that we talked about just like surrounded it. And it was like, yeah. like a, like a burrata of experience in a sense. I cream in the center and then all this yummy around the outside. Of my yeah, so many different layers going on with it. Um, I also find, and I don't know if you do too, but I'm getting after taking a bite of the cheese and then tasting the wine, I almost get a little bit of uh, like caramelized sugar almost, a little bit of that crystallized burnt yeah. sugar. That was my second note. I have honey and caramel, like just, wow, like the caramel starts coming out a little bit more. And I don't normally, yeah. think that I notice caramel with dulcet. I actually almost never say that. So that's the wine affecting the cheese in a sense. Yeah, I, I adore this combination. I'm glad that we picked this to be together. <laughs> yeah, I had um, kind of like bitter, and I say bitter in a good way, Brussels mm -hmm. sprouts with a little bit of a cherry note and then a flooding of pepper. That's Definitely. Right. You get a little bit of that like pyrazine kind of quality coming through, which uh, yeah. pyrazine, that's just a phenolic compound for those of you that aren't chemists or, or wine tasters or cheese tasters. It's the compound in a, a food um, that produces that kind of peppery um, sensation or flavor. Any thoughts from the, the crowd here? What do we all think of this one? Do we love this combination?
Any interesting notes? Great like, combo. So good. Ooh, love it. I love that. <laughs> Same. I, I completely agree. <laughs> so let's jump to the next wine then. Wine and the cheese. Uh, get back to sharing here. Julie, I, I, I just comment on one thing that I noticed in the yeah. chat randomly. I, I, I don't know. On, it's out of context, but I saw raw or pasteurized question mark, and I think it was oh. direct me. So in general, just so you know, all of these are pasteurized. We can talk more about that later, but just so you know, whoever asked that. I think it was Joe, maybe. Yeah. Just so you know, they're pasteurized. Okay. Let's see here. Sorry, guys. We'll just take, oh, there we go. <laughs> So, oh, we have one of, I think you guys are going to really like this wine if you haven't had a chance to try it yet. It's a single vineyard designate from us. So while the estate is this full picture realization of our estates, this kind of takes one of those elements and singles it out so you can just focus on the fruit from that uh, property, from our Elton property. Um, so let's all pour a little in our glasses if we haven't yet. So the 2017 Elton, um, as I mentioned, um, the Elton Pinot Noir, it was started by Dick and Betty O'Brien. They were former school teachers and they just fell in love with um, the idea of growing their own grapes after a trip um, actually in the wine country in Germany. And they eventually came back to the Yola Amity Hills and they converted Betty's parents' land uh, into a vineyard site slowly but surely. And they just became some of the most acclaimed growers in the valley. And we were really fortunate enough to be able to merge with them in about 2007. Um, and they became one of our uh, estate properties. And the really interesting and I think special thing that we have with them, um, they, they are so passionate about education and about um, continuing you know, education for growers in the Willamette Valley. So what they want us to do um, when eventually they do pass on, um, but in our contracts, they have written that uh, we will then take this value of their property, um, get it appraised, and instead of paying that money to their estate, we're gonna take half of that and donate half to Oregon State's Viticulture Program and the other to Chemeketa's as a way to continue on generations of just exceptional growers in the Valley. So it's 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 helpful for everyone by doing this. It's such a, a beautiful gesture that, that this partnership is creating with it. Um, now the wine, I think it speaks for itself. If you ever get a chance to go to Elton Vineyards, I feel like this smells and tastes as beautiful as the property there. They have about a two acre garden space there, which we hold this Elton garden party there about every June. Um, so any locals, um, let me know. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to share details with that, but it's so beautiful. Their garden, there's just things blooming all times of the year. They were big art collectors. So literally around every nook and cranny, you'll find these amazing statues and art pieces that are just surprising and unexpected. Um, it's a really, really lovely place. And I feel like the wine, it, it mirrors how lovely that vineyard is too. Um, just oh, the nose is, is amazing on it. And so uh, me and Brian have decided that we are going, we were going to pair it with the Marco Polo. This one right here. And Brian, would you like to talk a little bit about the Marco Polo? Yeah, so, you know, first I just wanna say this wine is amazing and I love the progression that we're on too. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the nuances of the wine in a minute, but wow, just wow, just wow. Wow, that's a great wine. Uh, Marco Polo, <laughs> <laughs> just wow. <laughs> uh, you're alone in a room, so you know, just I can yeah. see. Uh, Marco Polo. So I don't usually describe it this way when I'm in the shop because it confuses people, but essentially, flagship, our signature cheese, is, as I mentioned, is a cross between a cheddar and a gruyere, and it's aged about 15 to 18 months. Over time, that curd, day one, becomes flagship, and you get the nuance of uh, the flavors that you taste in flagship. With Marco Polo, this is only aged, or we say at least two months, but sometimes it can be aged more. So it has essentially the DNA, so to speak, of a flagship to become that over time, but we don't let it ever age that long, right? So it's fresh and crisp, at least it's creamy as far as the cheese goes. And then we add milled green and black peppercorns. And I would say milled because when you crack them in half and get little bites, they can be spicy sometimes. Well, spicy might not be the word I usually use, but peppery. Peppery in, in, a, 
it'll light up your mouth for sure. It has that heat, yeah. It has that, that warming heat. sensation. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a nice mix with the creaminess in it. We also make another one called um, Marco Polo Reserve. It's the same as the one we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's a little bit more earthy and has a natural rind, so a little bit different. So it's really nice in how it plays off, plays with the wine. So yeah, that's the cheese. I'm gonna do the pairings. So real quick though, Brian, what process did they fold in the peppercorns? What part of the process? As what part of the process? I'm sorry. What part of the process did the peppercorns get added? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So basically the initial pictures you saw, we cut the curd, we drain the, the, the liquid or the whey, and then we're, we're, we're stirring the, the curd once it's the larger form curd, the curds you normally eat. We'd sprinkle like during when we add the salt to slow down the lactic fermentation, we'll add the peppercorns right then. So it gets pressed initially in, in the first four hours of the cheese make. So yet again, kind of like when you have uh, pasta sauce, or lasagna or something you bake at home that you taste it and it's great the first day, but the next day it's even more because it gets to bake in. Um, chemically, I'm not sure you'd have to ask some of my colleagues, but I feel like that's what happens with all of the cheeses that you add a little bit of flavor to. Over time, it just kind of changes its nuance and just gets more interesting or different. Sometimes not so good and then we don't sell those, but generally speaking, always speaking of if you're buying one, that it's done something interesting and unique that's in, in, a, in a better way. So we add it right in the very beginning. Mm. That's good. Thank you for sharing that. I was curious. <laughs> I have I have a question. Oh, yes, Eva. What, what's your question? My question is in, about the cheese for Brian. Did you say that the Marco Polo is not aged as long as the... Um, Flagship. The flagship. flagship, because I guess it feels counterintuitive to me. It seems like if you age it longer, it'll get drier, because this is definitely not as creamy. It's very tasty, but it's not as creamy. So as creamy as I don't know how cheese gets made, and I just thought that the shorter you would age it, it would be the softer cheese. Now, a big thank you for the question. A big part of it could be, if I heard it right, well, let's just define. Our flagship is, is aged 15 to 18 months, but it's cryovac, so it tends to hold in some of its liquids, so to speak, and can be considered dry and crumbly or a little bit more moist. When we get into the reserves, which we haven't talked about yet too much, they are they drop in 12 to 14 percent moisture, so they are drier and more crumbly. Um, the Marco Polo that we just spoke of, that's in the cryovac also is plays off that it's 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 a little bit more moist in a sense also it's not aged as long right but the peppercorns can play off it a little bit too sometimes if you have a piece out it can dry out these pieces i have now feel almost like reserves just because they've been sitting out for a, a, a couple hours or so and then to complicate matters even more the reserve that i mentioned with peppercorns in it is a reserve that has peppercorns in it so it really just depends on which batch you're getting, they can all play a little bit differently. I would almost say in this scenario, all answers are yes, <laughs> because it just depends on the scenario. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for the question, Eva. That's that was a, a great, great question. question. Do we get to drink wine? Yes. <laughs> this is this is the, the best part. And I've been I've been having a, a few moments to really let this Elton sit in and, and analyze it a little bit. And I just you know, what I noticed I said. is that color has this amber on the outer edges, on the very outer edges, almost like an orange, like yeah. an amber orange. And then you get that deep, dark, I'm going to say, I'm going to already say it, that, that black cherry, which when I tasted it right away, I noticed it so much. So mm -hmm. It's like this really juicy, like black, like a pie, cherry from a pie almost. Right. And that color looks like a lava lamp. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have a gray floor here. So if I put it over my papers that have notes, it's a little bit lighter, but even yeah, so it looks like a sunrise. If anyone has a white surface, hold your glass up and find some good light. Um, light white surface is usually preferable and you can really take a look at the hues and kind of what Brian's talking about. So around the perimeter of, um, I guess, where the liquid is, it starts to kind of blend out and even that part is tinged a little bit and it does have a little bit of an amberness to it. Um, 
that can speak a lot to the age of a wine. So as the wines age, that part can get a little bit more amber and a little bit more darker. So this one, um, the 17 Elton, it's older than the Estate Pinot Noir. So whereas the Estate Pinot Noir, you may notice a little bit more violet intensity and hues. Um, this one, because it's had some time to age, it starts to get a little bit more of that orange peel color like Brian was saying. Oh, it's so great. That's, that's such a nice color. I have to look at my screen to see if you've tasted before I taste. So I see that I saw that glass go up and down. So yep. I'm going to taste. You go. <laughs> and it's just, it's so luxurious and velvety on them. Like the mouthfeel is what really does it for me with this wine. Like the flavors are great, but I just love just how it lingers on the palate. It's just very, very delightful. Um, and then as we'll take a bite of the. Oh my goodness, that is so, so, so good. That's my favorite so far. <laughs> when I ask everybody later what their favorite is, that's my favorite right now. Mm -hmm. That's a flagship, like almost more than anything. Cabot Clothbound gives it a little bit of a, no, I'm kidding. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the on the East Coast. I we have such a hard time with showing my bias because I always want to be like, this is my absolute favorite. But I always feel like, man, I don't want to leave anyone out if that might not have been their favorite because everyone does taste everything. So what is, differently, but I don't know how you cannot like this one. <laughs> don't yuck my yum. Yeah, I love that one saying. <laughs> now, this is a point I would say that I even opened when we were going through some of them, some crackers. Mm -hmm. I don't like mm -hmm. too much of it, but, um, you know, there's a big, a lot of questions about do you blow your palate if you get too far? Yeah, if you're doing a sensory evaluation, sure. But right now, I really want to taste it for what it is. So I have a little bit of a cracker. I'm going to help cleanse it a little bit. Uh, and a plain original cracker. There isn't much going on here. And at first, you know, when I was thinking about this pairing, I was worried that the pepper might overpower it. But I feel like they both kind of soothe each other out. Mm -hmm. um, it's it bring the pepper, I think, brings out a lot more of the fruit in the wine. So you get a little bit more of the raspberry quality. Right. Um, and then it's it it I don't think it overpowers that. It's they're just two completely similar, same, same, but different. Uh, it's a saying in Thailand that they use. Um, but it's I, I love the pairing together. Yeah, I, think I would say like, you know, we talked about like some you can taste one and then the other. So mm -hmm. like me, in this case, there was a little bit of a roller coaster with this one. This kind of made one more creamy with with the Marco Polo from Miss Pino. I had a new flavor arise. Granted, it was in the black cherry kind of zone, yeah. but I noticed a whole new flavor. They they merged together for me really nicely. Like just like I, I'm like, wow, what and then I actually had a hard time kind of defining what that was, but that's where the fun begins because I'm like, hmm, what do I know that that's similar to? And then you start going through your Rolodex of like, hmm, 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 hmm. I don't know. My my what does it taste like? And sometimes the tasting notes do help because it kind of gives you a direction a little bit. But in other cases, um, really it's just what you know and what you're familiar with. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I think we had a little glitch in the matrix. <laughs> I heard uh oh, and like at one level, uh oh, but I still heard you say uh oh, so that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like there's some people that really like this pairing. Um, anyone have any specific thoughts they want to share? Someone says pairs well with salami. I would agree. I don't have salami with me, but that sounds wonderful. Is that Jeffrey and Tammy? I see Anthony and Aaron. Um, that's you guys, Jeffrey and is it Tammy? The name's cut off part of the way. <laughs> Tamara? Oh, yeah, it's Jeffrey and Tamara. Oh, okay. The name was partially cut off on my screen. Wanted to make oh, sure I had it. It sounded like you all had a question. No, I, I paired it with Luxardo cherries and Ooh. some black pepper biscotti that I made. Okay. And it's phenomenal. I want your black pepper biscotti recipe. I want that. <laughs> Where do you live? Where do you live? Please, <laughs> I'm going to get in touch with you afterwards. Email me. Then. Check, check out my Instagram, Chef Tamara. I post. Oh my gosh, I will. I'm writing that note down. I'm, I, that note is going down fast. 
<laughs> yeah, black pepper biscotti sounds like a dream. Yeah. <laughs> Check out Chef Tamra Instagram. I posted a picture of your cheeses and your wines. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll love a little plug like that. Right. <laughs> now we had we had some summer sausage that worked well with the cheese and the uh, the wine too. And the wine and the cheese, everything's delicious, delicious. What I do, I like the idea of doing a summer sausage and the pepper cheese, the Marco Polo and the wine. It almost feels like a, a hunterman's platter, you know. Yeah. You get a lot of that kind of out in the woods, out in the elements, campfire feel to that. And the summer sausage, the summer sausage was more neutral than a salon or something or a sopresa that was would have been you know more spicy. I love that that's a great idea you know what's great too is when I go camping a lot I'll take the um the reserve with me the Marco Polo reserve and it's already kind of dried out so just kind of nice and you have a little bit of sausage with that or salumi or any of the things you have and it'll just hold it holds well in a bear can just so you know it almost like <laughs> turns it into a new cheese <laughs> If anybody knows, I will be adding that to my camping repertoire. Yeah. <laughs> I, came, I, I went and took, we have, we make another one, one called flag sheep and it's a blend of cow and sheep's milk and it's a reserve as well. And um, I had it in my bear canister for like a couple days. It was a whole new cheese when I pulled it out. It was great. Oh, I bet. That's kind of the, the fun thing about, I think these pairings is you can taste some of the cheeses at the very beginning, but I always love just seeing how it progresses as, you know, it's been sitting out and, you know, experiment with that on your, your own, everyone. That's just a great idea just to see what your preference is and you might, it might surprise you. Well, I hate to say, I want to like pour a little bit more of the Elton, but I know we need to move on to the <laughs> final line of the tasting. I might be savoring this bottle a little bit later. <laughs> um, num, 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 num. So next, everyone, we are going to be doing the 2016 Griffin Creek Cabernet Franc. Let me just share my screen here. And wow. so this one, um, it is from our, we're going to be pairing it with the flagship reserve. So feel free to start tasting this as we kind of go over a little bit of the history for both of these, uh, the wine and the cheese. Um, so it is from our Griffin Creek uh, label. Um, and you'll notice it has a completely different label uh, than the rest of our wines. And that a lot has to do with the strict labeling that we have in Oregon. So way back when Jim Bruneau first started the winery, the Willamette Valley wasn't even realized as a wine region yet. It wasn't until a few years later. And finally, when they were, you know, deciding on, you know, how should we, you know, how should we set ourselves apart? How should we make sure the quality of our fruit um, holds up and is recognizable. Um, they set standards that were higher than what the nation standards were. So in order to have this AVA, Willamette Valley, on the bottle, 100% of the fruit has to be from there, whereas a little the nation standards is about 85. Um, to have Pinot Noir, for instance, it has to be 95. The nation standards for varietal is about 75%. So when we wanted to make wine, out of the Rogue Valley, um, where the Griffin, where Quail Run Vineyard is, um, we had to design a completely different label. Otherwise, um, it gets a little bit confusing to the customers if they're like, I thought Willamette was supposed to have 100% of the fruit there, uh, but this is from the Rogue Valley. What's going on? So that's why we designed this Griffin Creek label, um, and we actually named it. Jim had taken a trip down there when he was, you know, first beginning to realize this plan to make wine from the Rogue Valley. Um, they were walking along and he came across this creek and he was like, well, well, what's the name of that creek right there? And um, I believe he was walking, Don and Trouty Moore are the owners of this particular vineyard. And they were like, well, that's, that's the Griffin Creek right there. And Jim was like, that's it. That's the name of the label. <laughs> and because, um, so if you've been down to Southern Oregon in the Rogue Valley, uh, Quail Run Vineyard, it's not too far from Ashland where they do the Shakespeare Festival every year. So you'll see it has a little griffin on there. It has a little bit of that Elizabethan aesthetic. Um, so that was a lot of the, the idea behind uh, the creation of that label. And now as we're enjoying the Cabernet Franc, so typically, 
This is a wine that's used with blends most of the time, but because it is grown so beautifully out there, we're able to single this out and just make beautiful wines just from the Cabernet Franc. Um, and so this is aged in French oak along similarly to the Elton and the Estate Pinot Noir. This does get a little bit longer time in the barrel though. Um, it's actually in the barrel for, I would say about 15 months and about 40% of that is new oak. So a little bit heavier barrel influence. Um, this is gonna be a lot better wine to age than the Pinot Noir. This will age a lot longer than the Pinots will. And we are going to be trying it uh, with the final cheese that we have selected today. It is the Beecher's Flagship Reserve. Brian, do you want us to yeah. tell us a little bit? Wow, that is such a complex mm -hmm. wine. So I'm, I'm excited to taste more. Flagship Reserve. So we've, I've picked this up a couple times over um, this, our session here. And this is just one section. If you can imagine four um pieces on top and four pieces on the bottom about a 17 pound truckle a truckle looks kind of like a, a a tree stump in a sense it's a wheel of cheese in a cylindrical shape and this idea of this truckle is we take the same recipe that we have for flagship a cross between a cheddar and a gruyere we fill it in a form or a mold that is um cylindrical of course and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap this truckle with cheesecloth and then we rub it with butter. We rub it with butter because it sits in an aging room or a, sometimes we'll say aging caves because traditionally a lot of cheeses were aged in caves to set the humidity. But we have aging rooms here in Seattle, just a few miles from where we make our cheese in Georgetown area. And what we're doing in Georgetown area is just an area section a few miles south of Pike Place Market where we make our cheese. And what we do is we wrap it in cheesecloth, rub it in butter, and allow it to age over time. While it's aging, the cheesemakers have to take, the, so we have our, our cheese on one rack, and we grab the cheese and flip it and set it on another rack. So all these cheeses are on a flip schedule. What happens in that case is also what's happening is we're, we have our, our gloves on, and it's almost like bees that pollinate different flowers. We're taking molds from one and transferring them onto another. These are all good molds. It's an environment that's 48 to let's say 55 degrees. So it's not very cold, it's cool and damp. We're setting the humidity a little bit higher than that. And the idea is we're creating the environment that will age this cheese the way we want this flavor to taste. So as mentioned earlier, we drop it from about 12 to 14% moisture from the flagship. It's not in a cryovac, it's open air aged, so to speak. And you get these wonderful textures Sometimes as it ages, you'll get tyrosine crystals, as I mentioned in this particular type, but typically you're just getting a nice, creamy, earthy, musky piece of cheese. Now I have a cross section because I've taken this flagship wedge, which comes off this piece and I've cut a little triangle off of it. Now, what's great about this triangle is this bite here, the very tip might be a little bit sweeter to most people's tongue because it's the center of that truckle, right? And as you get to the edge, you're getting to where that cheesecloth was. Now we have, at least before I sell it or before we, before we eat it, I pulled off that cheesecloth that's had a variety of molds. You might have scopulariopsis, and then we have, this is a longer explanation of it, but you have natural cheese mites in the cave that are eating that mold and creating more, it's an organism that's alive. That's the best way to describe it. It's alive, it's a fermented process, and wonderful flavors come out of these cheeses if you know how to basically be an artist at the same time as a scientist. It's a really nice process. So just like the wines, the cheese are fermenting over time and you get wonderful flavors that will promote caramel notes and earthy notes and all the, 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 the adjectives that you hear over and over again are because every area is creating a different system for different reasons. And that's what we do in Seattle here. We also do it in New York. If you ever go to New York or Beecher's in New York, we have a, a restaurant, at least it's a little bit on and off right now because of COVID. But if you go downstairs into the restaurant, right now we're doing wine and cheese classes downstairs and look to your left, we actually have a little bit of an aging cave or room or hallway, I would say there, where you can look through the glass windows and see these, these 
cheese is being aged. And over time, or at least along the shelf, you can see some that are aged more and some that are aged less based on the amount of mold growth that's on the outside. So Flagship Reserve won um, so many awards over time at the American Cheese Society. We're proud of it. We love it. For me, it's a testament to the cheesemakers and what they do in their craft and their art. So pairing it with this wine in particular that Julie picked and I picked was just like, wow, it's just amazing together. And we want to know what you know and what you're thinking. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. But what, wow. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I have a couple it's, it's, of great questions there, uh, Brian, um, from Ava and Charlie wondering if, is the butter rub happening only once? Initially, yes. So it, we wrap we wrap the cheesecloth once, we rub it in butter. It doesn't get other layers of butter. It just dries out over time. Initially, what's happening is one layer, I could name one, and I'm not a dairy scientist in the way that my colleagues are, but one layer of, of let's say, white-ish mold grows cheese mites that are naturally in the cave, in the room, eat that mold and then other molds grow, right? So the process continues on. What the butter does in a lot of ways is it prevents the outside from drying and cracking so much that we can't sell it on the open market. We want it to be nice when we peel that off and nice and even. So every, even just applying the butter is really important and how smooth it is because mold will get in different crevices and what, the cheesemonger, the person that sells the cheese at the counter, what my title is, you know, we have to we have to sell it to the public and talk about it. So you want it to be nice and even. So a nicely even piece of cheese at the end, ideally you're going to be able to eat right up to the rind, and you can eat the rind if you like it. It just depends on the cheese. So yeah, and Brian, would you mind just kind of clarifying real quick what? Um, sorry, what age or stage is the cheese firm enough? to come from the mold to be able to be wrapped. So what, I'm sorry, say that one more time. Let's see here. What age or stage is the cheese firm enough? This question is from Bruce and Vicki, so maybe they uh, can jump on too. Um, what age or stage is the cheese firm uh, enough to come from the mold to be able to be wrapped? Let me lead with, and they may clarify, let me lead okay. with depends on what cheese you're actually making. So if you're making a soft ripened cheese out of the gate, the pH is a little bit lower, it's already soft. It's, it's, we drain all the liquid, cheese starts with milk, becomes a curd. The curd could be a, a custard-like consistency that's liquidy and we put it in a mold and we don't touch it till it's just barely, it's fragile. So it's just barely able to be picked up and then we roll it in salt. Then we grow white molds, these are the brie style cheeses around it. So. I think the way I would answer that question is from the beginning, always, it just depends on how much liquid you've drained out of it to determine what you're going to do and how firmly you can handle it. Does that kind of make sense? Maybe kind of sort of, okay, hopefully that does. <laughs> so you can start, you can start aging that cheese at any firmness. You just have to be more gentle with it. If it's a soft ripened cheese and it's in that direction and you can kind of, handle it a little bit more firmly if it's the harder cheeses but either way they're all generally a little softer in the beginning and they get a little drier in the end in a in a soft ripened cheese one thing to add to that this is not a soft ripened cheese but just pretend for a second the outer edges have this nice translucency over time and i like to say from the beginning of my cheese career that that it ripens from the outside in so you see that brie style cheese that's sort of slowly getting gooey from the outside it's like the bacteria is eating the lactose, metabolizing, eating the lactose, metabolizing, eating the lactose, metabolizing. So the center is nice and dry and chalky. The French, at least from what I read in a book once, call it the soul of the cheese, right? And so it's nice and sweet and tangy and citrusy in the beginning, those brie style cheeses, and then gets nice and runny as it, as it goes on and it runs out the door like the Monty Python's. It's not much of a cheese shop, is it? <laughs> so basically a hard cheese ripens universally or at least all at the same time, it's pH a little bit higher. So um, it just depends on the cheese essentially. Okay, that's good. Um, we had a few other questions also. Wanna make sure everyone's answered. Annette, hi Annette. Uh, Annette wanted to know what exactly cryovac means. Oh, plastic wrapped. I just like to not say plastic because none of us really want to use plastic, but it's a little in inevitable in the industry that we do it. Um, but yeah, cryovac is just like, you know, like you shrink wrap or heat seal and you get it nice and tight. 
essentially it's just got a nice nice firm grip now if it off gases because the cheese is alive and essentially gets a little puffy in there mold is going to start to grow and that's okay as mentioned earlier just trim that mold off and continue to eat your cheese otherwise i don't have one here but if you were just hand wrap a cheese in food film or saran wrap um sometimes you'll see a little bit mold underneath the label because from a from a store uh, ideally you're getting a cheap piece of cheese that's cut and wrapped within a day or two it's not always the case it's okay sometimes they'll put the cut wrap date all of it just depends on if you like to eat it and if it tastes good that's cool uh last question then and then we can i think finish up our notes on the griffin creek cabernet franc and wow time's starting to fly i had no idea what time it was i hope everyone's still still hanging on with us <laughs> Crazy. That's crazy. This is good. <laughs> this is like a dinner party. It's so <laughs> fun. <laughs> so Ava and Charlie, you guys have had the best questions. I love it. Is the butter rub that you had mentioned, is it happening only once? And they did mention that they thought the cheese was fantastic too. <laughs> Compliments to the chef. I think he addressed that one. Did he? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the cheese makers and the winemakers. <laughs> Well, Brian, what do you think about the wine? And you've had a chance to- One, I love it, love it, love it. Okay, I've said mm -hmm. that about all of them, so that's not saying much. Um, I love how much black cherry it is and how earthy it is and how complex it is. But what I'm also noticing is, you know, your tasting notes are spot on. Baking spices, anise was very subtle and I wanted to find it. Yeah. This is kind of a note to just people trying to find the things that you see in the tasting notes. I was trying to find it. Then I'm like, did I really notice it? Or am I noticing it now just because- it said it. If you don't notice it, you don't notice it. It's okay. It doesn't matter. But after a while, I think I started I'm like, oh, wow, it's really subtle and nuanced, but it's there. And that's cool. And I do notice like a lot of the baking spiciness, specifically the anise that you mentioned, it comes out a lot when you, after you taste the flagship reserve, it's a little bit more prominent right. then. And that's what you said earlier too. Like you mm -hmm. have a bite and then it, it brings out the wine a little bit more too. Mm -hmm. This is great. I get a lot of really nice, like smoky plum, a little bit of leather. Um, it's just like almost like a candied plum almost too. Well, this particular batch of flagship reserve is so buttery that I have right now. It's amazing. I, I like, we say buttery a lot too, but when you notice that butter, it's so buttery. And what it does is it's coating the outside of my mouth. I'm enjoying all the, the descriptors for the wine kind of going down the chute, so to speak, you know, and like mm -hmm. all those nuances and then the butter just kind of like follows it right after. But once the buttery taste is gone, I'm still noticing the earthy, peppery, black cherry of the, the Absolutely. wine. Absolutely. Yeah. So good. Now I don't know if that's my favorite or that's my favorite, but it's still the second, the third or the fourth for sure. Not that's to so love good. kids. I don't like these kids more than these kids. <laughs> Like which kid is your favorite? <laughs> That's hard to say. I, I don't know. I, it depends on which one one's right in front of me. I think. <laughs> you know, I know for sure that I'm my mom's favorite child, but I'm an only child, so you know. <laughs> I think I might be my parents' favorite child too. <laughs> and I'm only saying that because I may have one of my siblings on this call. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I'm pretty sure it, it was someone that is not her kid. You know. <laughs> Eric from across the street or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so other wine tasters and cheese nibblers, what uh, what do we think of this pairing together? Anyone has any specific notes that uh, you're getting from it that maybe we haven't mentioned? I have a comment. Yes. I, I, I uh, Hi, good evening. I snuck forward. I, I absolutely loved the um, the flagship and I couldn't resist. I had to taste the reserve next to it with the white wine. And I wasn't terribly impressed with the reserve at that moment. And yet after going through several red wine tastings and progressive experiences here with the cheese, the reserve really changed for me on the palate with the introduction of the red wines. So I've, I've learned something. Usually I eat cheese and drink wine. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's just been interesting to see that progressive um, experience, experience it and 
taste it. And uh, I really appreciate the value of the pairings tonight. Oh, that's so sweet of you yeah. to say, Vicki. I'm so glad we could help you discover, you know, these this new love for you. That's so amazing. Oh, thank, thank you. you. That means a lot. <laughs> you bring up a great point too, because we went with what we thought and initially, um, but experiment, cross, try them all differently. I, I hope you already have. But as Vicky was saying that, I tried the reserve with the with the uh, white, and wow, I just grapefruit, mm -hmm. grapefruit, 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 it was so good. I love that because I usually, I actually, that's a great point. I love the reserve with the Pinot Blanc because when I'm usually pairing a cheese with the Pinot Blanc, I usually grab something like a Parmesan, um, right? Or a pecorino to go with it. Right, right. That's so good. And also, like we, like all the cheeses here right now today are cow's milk. We do a, we do yeah. one blend and one full. Oh. At the same time, what we want to do is like when you have sheep milk cheeses or goat milk cheeses, you're going to get more in your life. Than you never know you can. So, Brian, um, how do you guys pick which cheese goes with which wine? I mean, if I go to Costco and buy, you know, five ninety nine brick of cheddar, um, can, can I drink that with my four ninety nine, you know, gris, or what do I do? Person, is it? I don't. Mean, you can absolutely one thousand percent do that. Do what you like. So when we get into what we're doing with Julie and I, sure, we're dialing it in more and more and more, but. Like generally what I say, and Julie, I'm curious what you say too. I usually map, match strengths, right? If I have, if you just said, Julie, if you have a parm, um, you might want to, well, I, I'm going to say it this way. If you have a parm, you might want to go with a stronger wine in general. So when I, I might go with a Cabernet Sauvignon or something, when I have a lighter cheese, I might go with a lighter wine. Now that is not the script at all. It's just something, a very basic thing to say at our cheese counter, right? But the great thing is you're the expert too. If you have a sense and you at least know what that cab or that Pinot or that, you know, 599 block of cheese tastes like, grab it, try it, and you'll know at least the, the next trip you'll know, oh God, that doesn't go at all. Never do it again. Never do good. You'll definitely remember the ones you don't like. Like I taste certain beers and cheese a lot and I'm like, I gotta get out of my mouth. And I'm so <laughs> And I never want to do it, right? And you remember the ones you love and you keep visiting it back and back. So just have fun and experiment with it. It'll be fun. That, I couldn't agree more, Brian. That's that's the way I usually apply when I'm planning, you know, to do pairings like this. Exactly. It's 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 I try and base it on mainly the, the people who I'm serving's preferences too. But again, playing to intensities too. Um, and you can play with uh, that in a sense of you can have the intensities near each other, or even sometimes um have them be contrasting if you have something that's a little funkier that's going to go really nice with something um that's you know going to be a little higher in acidity and a little bit sweeter so you play with the the different spectrums of flavors and contrasts and it's up to you guys and i think the best way to do that you know we all i think live in areas where you know our grocery stores have most of us great cheese shops so you can chat with your local you know cheesemonger there and i'm sure they would be able to offer really great opinions as well and great suggestions you can, yeah you can always do vicky's model and if they don't pair well together you eat cheese and then you eat wine and then you eat cheese and then you eat wine one thing i like to say also what you want to do is perspective is definitely try to try some of the ones cheeses you wouldn't normally try like washed frying cheeses the stinky ones if you're not like really into it or blue cheese try to experiment with them and then you'll find things you never thought you would like before and maybe initially you don't even think you like it but it's like because it's so different but then you can really get into the things that julie and i dial into every single day you're like wow i really never thought i would like that but it tastes like peanut butter and Manchego, jelly, and marshmallows, I don't know. Whatever you come up with, it's just fun and it's good. And I'm going to do that tonight for dinner, pretty much. Yeah, always. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely experiment and, um, you know, experiment and play around with the different flavors, um, especially with the cheeses that we're having today. You know, don't just follow by the book, you know, what what we have here. So, uh, Mix and match. Uh, um, this is your chance for a commercial opportunity. Um, we usually send Hickory Farms uh, for Christmas. Uh, do you have Christmas packages and stuff like that? We definitely do. Um, <laughs>
is at the helm taking all your orders. We have um, classic collections and cheese and chocolate collections. Just visit petrocheese.com and they will, they will, Emily will guide you along. If you have any questions and if you're internet savvy and you want to do it that way, that's great. If you have, if, if you're not and you just want to call on the phone, you can call the customer service line there. It's really just Emily, she's the, the, the cheese queen. <laughs> all those things. So, and if you need something special, she'll take care of you too. She, we're, she's really great. So Absolutely. And I can help okay. you with Emily too. Okay. Everyone's, getting, everyone's getting Willamette Valley wine and Beatrice cheese for Christmas this year. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I love it. Well, me and Brian are here to help with those packages when you're ready. <laughs> now, do you have any specific questions for me specifically? Um, you can go through BeecherSheets.com and Emily will send you my way. My email is Brian at B-R-I-A-N at SugarMTN.net. You can find it. Don't worry right now. We'll put it in there. But um, you can always ask me any cheese questions. If I don't know and I don't know a lot and I know a lot, let me know and I'll find it for you. Absolutely. And so I sent you all those handy virtual tasting forms. So there is a section for notes at the bottom. So if anyone is interested in me connecting them with Emily to order more cheeses to go with their wines, um, please let me know uh, and I can help set that up for you all. Um, so, but uh, so if Jill, any more questions, oh, hi Dirk. Sorry. Yeah, we got a question. We're, we're here in, in, in Central Mass off the map and we wanna know when you and Crystal are gonna be coming up to New England so that we can do cut in on a uh, an actual live tasting for Willamette. Yes, well, you just say the word and we'll be up there. But I know we do have a great national presence in the area. Uh, one of my colleagues, Darrell, uh, she travels up to the area in normal times uh, pretty frequently. So we can set you up and maybe you know, set a private tasting up and we do wine dinners too in the areas. So, you know, happy to, to keep you connected and update you when we're going to be out by you. That'd be so much fun. Let us know. We, we've loved the wine and the cheese. It's been a great night. Absolutely. Well, this has been fun. Any last questions for the evening? Any dying questions that you've been having for either myself or for Brian? Just give me everything you got, guys. Questions for Brian. Favorite favorite cheese rinds to use for cooking? You know, Parm is typically a go-to. Even some of the stores will like take the rinds and and throw them in. I eat the rinds, so I don't cook with them. Now, okay. <laughs> it's the rind. If it's the rind like this, where there was a cloth on the outside, it tastes like paper to me. I don't. I use it as a handle, and I eat it right up to the. I see what it's <laughs> right in the nub. Right up to the nub. And if I'm hungry, I eat it all. It doesn't even matter. So. Um, right. If I think of anything, I'll send it. I'll send it in the direction. Of, how do I send it to you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I pretty much eat the rinds myself, so I don't really cook with them too much. But generally, you can get chunks of flavor in in a lot of the harder cheeses that are natural rinded. So I would lean towards those. I've cooked. I've even made grilled cheese sandwiches with soft ripened cheese. I don't personally love it so, so much because our soft ripened cheese can get a little bit ammoniated on the outside. Mm -hmm. And if it gets a little ammoniated in that case, I usually put a little compote or jam or some kind of preserve and it balances it out again, or I have a nice wine to do the same thing. Um, but yeah, yeah, experiment, have fun. Trippy. So I have a question Trippy. for you, Brian. Oh, yeah. sorry, <laughs> I just jumped right in. <laughs> no. Can you give us an update on visiting the winery? Absolutely. So we are slowly starting to open up. So for anyone that is local or wanting to visit, uh, we have a few experiences. Of course, we're still limited capacity, um, but we have opened up reservations for table side tastings. Um, and I'll give you my email address um, here. But if anyone is interested in reservations for table side tastings, or we have, I don't know if you've seen pictures of the wine pods that we have. We have. There. So those are so much fun because they allow you to, you know, brave the elements while not being completely drenched with rain. And you can still, you know, take in all of the amazing views that we have out there. Um, and for anyone that's traveling, we do have guest suites on our property too that you can book. Those are available throughout the pandemic because you're just in a little room and 
all you're left with is some great wine and a great view. So what can beat that? Um, and then we also have private tasting experiences too. So I myself love um, when people reach out to me and I get the chance to show them around the winery and we get to build um, flights based on your preferences. So again, happy to, to help coordinate that for you as well if anyone is interested. Um, and on top of that, for people that live outside of the state, um, we're doing private virtual tastings too. So if anyone has, you know, family, friends that all are all across the country, you know, we can help connect you guys and, and create something special just uniquely for you too. So again, that's something I'd, I'd be more than happy to help uh, plan and coordinate for you. Yes, right. I can come down to what Julie said too. We're doing that for Beechers as well. Not exactly the same. So if you want to do a virtual tasting, um, again, visit BeecherCheese.com, contact customer service, and we will be there to help you. Same person doing all, paying attention to the men. <laughs> um, as far as visiting Beecher's, um, come down to Pike Place Market. We have nine milk jugs you can sit on. Right now we're at, at, at like 20% capacity. We're going to 50% capacity, but we're pretty much to go anyways um, in that sense, but you can order online. And um, again, you can see all of the tour from Pike Place Market or New York anyways. So there you're already, it's already open. So in that sense. Well, as I said, Brian, I'm going to come visit you this weekend. So better save me a table. Nice. <laughs> the milk jug, so as long as you're comfortable. I guess that'll be okay. <laughs> Well, I, I think we should probably wrap it up, although it's it's so bittersweet to say goodbye. This has been such a fun tasting. Everyone has had such great comments and questions. Um, and if anyone has additional questions uh, afterwards, you know, you can always email me, email Brian, email us both together. We can get in on a big group chat, uh, talk cheese and wine to you all day, which we're, we've been doing. Um, and it's been, it's been so much fun, but it's, it's been really nice having everyone on today. You know, I miss so much seeing people and I've been working a little bit more remotely, but so to, to just have, you know, this wonderful group that we've had this evening, it's, it almost feels like we're at a dinner party a little bit. And I think we're, we've all become a little bit, a little bit of best friends by the end of it, or at least, you know, good wine drinking friends, which is the best part. So again, any questions, if anyone wants to have any of this more any more of the wines or cheeses sent their way let me and brian know um but i just wanted to send us off with a cheers thank you guys so much for joining this has been such cheers. a beautiful you. time i really enjoyed your company thank, thank you, so you. Much. thank you everybody so thank much you. thanks brian cheers cheers hello it's cool prost <laughs> prost <laughs>